Chapter 7 of The Little Colonel at Boarding School. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Little Colonel at Boarding School by Annie Fellows Johnston. Chapter 7 The Halloween Masquerade. "'I'll make a light,' said Betty, grouping across the room with a handful of matches, which she had taken from the box in the hall. Lloyd started to follow, but stumbling over a footstool felt her way to the bed, and sat down on the edge of it to wait for a light. On the way up from supper she had started to repeat a funny story which she had heard at Clovercroft that afternoon and she kept on with it as Betty, having found her way to the table, struck a match. But she stopped again as the match went out with a sudden puff, as if a strong draught had blown it. "'There, it never fails to do that when I'm in a hurry!' exclaimed Betty, striking another match as she spoke. It was extinguished as suddenly as the first. She tried another and another with the same result. "'How strange!' she said wonderingly. "'There isn't a window open anywhere, is there?' "'It's the witches,' declared Lloyd, laughing. "'There must be one standing there by your elbow.' The laugh ended in a piercing shriek as she felt something clutch her ankle. "'Murder! Murder!' she yelled. "'Oh, there's something awful under the bed. It grabbed me by the foot. How? Oh, oh. how?' hush up goosey commanded a familiar voice and as betty struck her fifth and last match which burned steadily they saw allison dashing to the door to lock it doors were opening all along the corridors and footsteps hurrying from every direction in response to lloyd's terrified cry tell them that it's all right that it's only a halloween scare demanded allison in a stage whisper don't let them in I blew out the matches, and it's only Kitty and Kate under the beds. "'It's all right,' called Lloyd in a quavering tone, but the matron's knock was imperative, and Betty, beckoning the girls frantically toward the closet, fumbled with the bolt until they had whisked into hiding. The one brief glimpse of the rag dolls falling over each other in their mad haste to escape was so comical that both Lloyd and Betty were choking with laughter when the matron entered. They could hardly control their voices while they tried to tell her how the matches had gone out, and Lloyd had imagined that there were witches in the room. Smiling indulgently at their foolishness, which she attributed to the excitement of the occasion, the matron withdrew. She could hear them still laughing when she passed through the hall again, several minutes later for the rag dolls coming out of the closet as soon as she disappeared began taking one ridiculous pose after another in the middle of the floor the solemn silence in which they struck their limp boneless attitudes made the scene all the funnier and as the girls looked at the surprised expressions allison had painted on the flat muslin faces they went into such hysterical laughter that the tears streamed down their faces. "'Oh, girls, do stop!' begged Lloyd finally, wiping her eyes. "'I've laughed till I ache, and it's time for me to dress, for I promised Magnolia to help her into her costume.' Katie and Kitty subsided into a heap on the divan. "'Could you have told who we were if you hadn't known we were coming?' asked Katie never in the world answered betty i couldn't tell which is which now if it were not for your voices we're not going to say a word to any one said katy we oughtn't to talk you know if we carry out our part as it should be we'll slip up into the gymnasium pretty soon and be sitting on the door in a corner when the others come up we'll lop around and watch the fun till the unmasking begins then we'll come down here and wait for the rest of you all the time they had been performing allison had been busy before the mirror 
and now turned around in her spectral attire. "'The ghost of the veiled lady!' cried Lloyd. "'Oh, Alison, you make up is splendid. You're enough to freeze the blood in one's veins. There couldn't be anything more spooky-looking than that thin tall veil. I wish Mom Beck could see you. I've heard her talking about that queer little woman whose house used to stand where the seminar cellar is dug now, till I couldn't close my eyes at night. All the darkest believe she still haunts the place. Betty had never heard the story, so Alison repeated it while she dressed, adding, You too must do all you can to spread the report that I am lurking around. You have seen me yourself, you know. If I had my lump of ice, you'd soon feel the touch of my clammy fingers. I wish you'd give me a piece of newspaper to wrap it in, Betty. Then it won't drip. I wish we could carry a lump of ice around with us, gasped Kitty. All this cotton packed around my head and neck makes me so hot I can scarcely breathe. Miss Edith and Mrs. Clelling, putting the finishing touches to the decorations in the gymnasium, looked around, well pleased. A score of jack-o'-lanterns screened sociably from the brackets between the windows. Two more kept guard on each side of the piano, and at least a dozen lighted the long table stretched across one end of the room, on which the spread was arranged. Graceful sprays of bittersweet vine trailed their bright berries over the white cloth. A huge pumpkin bowl piled with grapes formed the centerpiece. A pitcher of sweet cider stood at each end, and nuts, persimmons, popcorn balls, gingerbread, and apples filled all the space between. "'It is well worth the trouble,' said Miss Edith, lighting the last candle. "'The girls will enjoy it thoroughly.' Someone called both teachers from the room just then, and in their absence two uninvited guests, who had been waiting behind the door, flurried in and seated themselves on the floor in the dimmest corner. "'I should say it's worth the trouble,' whispered one ragdoll to the other, as they looked around the room at the fantastic decorations. "'It's a lot more fun coming here thus way than having the party at home and it's more fun than if we'd been invited i'm nearly roasted panted the other one but i'm glad i'm here oh how pretty it was the entrance of one of the older girls in court train and powdered hair that caused the exclamation and while they were trying to guess who it could be the others began to arrive old king cole and pocahontas came in arm in arm followed by red riding hood and a brownie while puss in boots proudly escorted aladdin with his lamp little boo peep and boy blue were soon recognized for betty had made no attempt to hide the brown curls which helped to make her such a pretty little dresden shepherdess and while lloyd had gathered up her long light hair under the wide-brimmed hat with its blue ribbon every graceful gesture and every step she took holding herself erect with a proud lifting of the head proclaimed the little colonel for once in her short life little magnolia Boudin tasted the sweets of social success for no one there was more popular or more admired than the saucy knave of hearts with the putting on of the costume she had put on a courage and self-possession that never could have been assumed with the old-fashioned tight-waisted blue merino and the stiff short tails of hair grasping the stolen tart firmly in her chubby hands and lifting the little slippers with their huge bows and buckles in the high mincing step miss catherine had taught her she swaggered coquettishly up and down the room a red mantle sweeping behind her. Wherever she went, a flock of admiring girls crowded around her. For many a month afterward, her red and white crown hung over her mirror, not only as a souvenir of the jolly revel, 
but as a token that for one night at least she had found favour in the eyes of the princess not only had lloyd circled around her when she was dressed exclaiming again that she looked perfectly lovely but when they chose partners for the ghost walk to march solemnly through the halls to the slow music of the dead march the princess had chosen her lloyd had looked around for ida who had come as a puritan maid but the cap and kerchief were nowhere to be seen she had evidently grown tired of the affair and gone to her room magnolia did not know that she was second choice her cup of happiness was overflowing when boy blue turned away from aladdin and red riding hood who were both trying to claim her and said no this little knave must be my partner he has stolen my heart as well as the queen's tarts in their corner near the piano kitty and katie sat stiffly against the wall seemingly incapable of moving themselves several times some of the larger girls made an attempt to lift them and in whatever position they fell when they were dropped they lay with hands thrust out and heads lolling to one side there was a laughing crowd around them continually oh my country gasped katie as the first solemn chords of the dead march struck her ear and all light in the room was suddenly extinguished except what gleamed from the eyes and mouths of the jack-o'-lanterns they've gone and dragged in old sally the skeleton it's bad enough to hear her bones rattle in the physiology class in the daytime but this is more than i bargained for now is the time for us to go whispered kitty they'll unmask soon we've seen how they all look and set them to guessing and we'd better miss the refreshments than run the risk of being discovered katy eyed the table wishfully it seems a pity to miss all that spread couldn't we creep around the wall to the far side and slip something into our apron pockets the cloth is so long it would hide us what's to hinder our getting under the table and staying through the whole performance suggested kitty the cloth comes nearly to the floor and i don't believe anybody would think of looking under it then we could hear them wonder who we are and where we've disappeared to when they unmask and we are missing quick then while their backs are turned exclaimed katy not waiting to consider consequences or means of escape later in the evening slowly solemnly with measured tread the long procession filed by and wheeling to the music started back toward the other end of the long gymnasium creeping on hands and knees fearful lest some backward glance might discover them should they stand erect the two girls like weary mice scuttled across the room and disappeared under the sheltering tablecloth grown bold with their successful venture kitty proposed that each time the procession turned away from them they should reach out and grab something from the table it was an exciting performance time after time as the motley figures turned their backs two ludicrous heads popped up above the table and four white woolen gloves clawed hastily at different dishes when the marauders dropped from sight the last time there was a goodly store of provisions gathered up in each gingham apron i wouldn't have missed this for anything giggled katie some time later when the unmasking began and the girls crowded around the table for nuts and apples with which to try their fortunes in such a babel of voices there was no danger of being overheard listen we can tell from the different remarks who every one represented they whispered to each other oh evelyn ward i knew all the time that you were the court lady i recognized your rings that's what fooled me about aladdin susie figs had changed rings with ada well i guess nearly everybody the first half hour except those ridiculous rag dolls does anybody know where they have gone 
that started the discussion the two under the table had been waiting for and the various guesses falling wide off the mark were so amusing that their mirth nearly betrayed their hiding place once they thought their discovery was certain they had been feeding themselves from the store of provisions in their aprons as well as the size of their muslin mouths would allow the mouths had been only small slits at first but they had stretched and torn them with their fingers until they were large enough to allow them to take a good-sized bite of apple as they sat there munching nuts and popcorn kitty whispered we're like the man in the verse there was a young man so benighted he never knew when he was slighted he went to a party and ate just as hearty as if he'd been really invited katie tried hard not to laugh but the effort ended in a snort and she almost choked on a grain of popcorn if someone had not upset a jack-o'-lantern just then and started a wild scramble to put out the candle before it burned the cloth the unbidden guests must certainly have been discovered gradually the crowd around the table dwindled away as little groups gathered in different parts of the room intent on various ways of fortune-telling having eaten all they could and not being able to hear anything more of interest the girls under the table began to grow tired of their position moreover the heat of their costumes seemed to grow more unbearable every minute we're in a trap groaned katie how we are ever going to make our escape is kitty never heard the rest of the sentence for half a dozen girls who had ventured down the cellar steps with candle and looking-glass came bursting into the room almost hysterical with fright breathless from their headlong race up three flights of stairs they gasped out their news in broken sentences each voice in a different key oh a real ghost none of your sheet and pillowcase affairs white hair and a face like marble and a long floating veil and it clutched mary phillips with fingers that were like the dead didn't it mary no it didn't come out of the cellar it just appeared the most awful wail as it vanished the cook saw it earlier in the evening floating away toward the graveyard not walking you know but floating about a foot above the ground alison has evidently had as much fun as anybody whispered kitty oh will you listen there goes lloyd vowing it's the spirit of the veiled lady and that she saw it twice this evening and betty too that will convince them if anything could betty's always so serious in the way she tells things now is the time to go while they're all so excited and in the other end of the room whispered kitty let's make a wild dash for the door nearest us bang it behind us and blow out the hall light then we can slide down the banister put out the light in the lower hall and be safe in the west wing before they come to their senses now ready it was a daring move but it proved successful every one heard a scramble and turned in time to see two crouching figures dash into the hall they were too startled to know whether they were human or not somebody screamed when the door banged violently and mary phillips who had been in a tremble ever since her flight from the cellar was nearly paralyzed with fright she clutched her nearest neighbor wailing oh what is it by the time matches were brought and the lamps were relit katie and kitty were safely locked in lloyd's room tearing off their disguises and wiping their perspiration from their flushed faces for a few minutes they waited half expecting that a search would be made but as time went on and no one ventured into that part of the house they began to try the halloween charms that they could not take part in upstairs when Alison came in half an hour later, she found them whirling apple parings around their heads and flinging them over their shoulders to see what initials they would form in falling. 
by the time alison had washed the powder from her face and picked the cotton from her hair lloyd and betty came in it seemed as if they could never settle down enough to think of sleep there was so much to talk over alison curled up on the divan announcing that it was not worth while to undress as it would soon be time for them to start home kitty and katie followed her example appropriating lloyd's single bed lloyd and betty took the other one and they lay whispering until midnight just as the clock struck twelve lloyd got up and lighted a candle five eggs which she had boiled in the chaffing dish earlier in the evening lay on a plate on the table the jorks had been removed and the space filled with salt according to previous agreement each girl got up and took one of the eggs standing in the middle of the floor in solemn silence they ate them stoically although the salt burned and choked them then without a drop of water afterward they walked backward to bed according to the charm whatever they dreamed after that performance would come true and unless they were to be old maids someone would appear in their dreams bearing a cup of water that one would be their fate none of the five slept soundly that night the salt made them thirsty the crowded quarters restless alison wakened every time a rooster crowed or a dog barked because she felt that the responsibility of getting home before barbary wakened rested upon her once when she was about to sink into a delicious doze the shrill whistle of a locomotive aroused her to the consciousness that the early freight train was rumbling past the depot opening her eyes she saw that the gray dawn was beginning to steal over the valley with a groan she sat up and stumbled across the room to rouse the others she had to shake kitty several times and when she at last staggered to her feet she yawningly quoted old aunt cindy's expression that she was as tired as a thousand of dogs and vowed she could never get home unless she was dragged there katy complained of a headache and a miserable after the ball feeling it was a sorry-looking little trio which finally stumbled down the back stairs and out into the frosty dawn not a word was spoken on the way home in silence they slipped up the stairs at the beaches in silence they undressed and crept into bed and three hours later when barbary came as usual to call them she knocked half a dozen times before she succeeded in arousing them End of chapter 7 Read by Lars Rolander